Amen. All right, so we're beginning in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and uh, I do appreciate the prayer there. i got to just say I'm not the pastor, okay? So sorry, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. I just don't want anybody else thinking, oh, he's letting it go to his head. He's not saying anything. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, I'm the deacon, not the pastor, so... Uh, I, I, uh, that's fine though. I appreciate that. There was some good seed planted, by the way. I, I spoke with uh, a young man uh, for. I gave him the whole gospel. He understood. You know, people they, they give you the answers as you go. You know, and they and they're either getting it or they're not. And one thing that I've always tra- and this is just nothing to do with the sermon, but uh, I just think it's so important as we knock these doors uh, to ask that question. It's something I've just tried to train myself to do. When you get to the end, when you. Even if they've given you all the right answers, and they said, yeah, I believe, it's all by faith, you can't lose it, they'll say all the right things because you're teaching them as you go. You're telling them what the answers are, which is the way it ought to be. But at, you know, at the very last thing I always ask them before I'll ever pray with anybody is, what do you personally believe a person has to do to go to heaven? Because now it's on them to tell, them, tell you, and, and most t- nine times out of ten, people are going to tell you exactly what they believe. And sure enough, this young man, I mean, he was receptive, he was... He was getting it. He was even answering some of the correct answers before he even got there. He was, he was putting it together. But when I asked him that question, what do you believe a person has to go to heaven? Well, you've got to repent of your sin. He'd still hung on to that from the very beginning. So, um, you know, I think that's just really important. But it was a very good seed that was planted, and I, I was glad to have been there. And I just, just took that moment there to kind of throw that out there. I think that's just something we as soul owners should definitely always be trying to do. Um, but anyway, we're in First Timothy tonight, so let's get into that. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's interesting, an interesting greeting. It's, uh, you see a lot of uh, Paul's greetings start out this way, uh, very similarly worded, especially uh, when, he's, when he's writing to Timothy and Titus. But even elsewhere in the scripture, he uses a lot of these same phrases. And one of these phrases that he uses is God our Savior. Now, it's kind of interesting the way he uses it there because he says, by the commandment of God our Savior, right? And then he says, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. So I believe he's actually referring to two different people there because here we believe in the Trinity. We believe that God is three distinct persons that make up one God. So (coughs) he's saying there, God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he kind of backs that up when he gets down there into chap- or verse 2 where it says, Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. So God the Savior and God the Father, right? Now you say, well, wait a minute. Jesus is the Savior. Well, that's true too. Jesus is the Savior. But here's the thing. God is our Savior. And since all three are God, they're all our Savior. So God our Savior, I believe there is a reference to God the Father, that even God the Father is our Savior. Now that shouldn't be you know, anything too far-fetched. That's, I don't think that's, we're, we're rocking anybody's theology with that this evening. But uh, it is something that's p- worth pointing out as we go through and be reminded that you know, the triune nature of God, that God is, is three persons in, in one God. Go, if you would keep something there, of course, in 1 Timothy all night, but go over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. You know, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But we'll see some of the same uh, phraseology used here. It says, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, so there it is again, God our Savior, who have all been to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So again, of course, there he's referring to God our Savior. right? Now what's interesting here in 1 Timothy 2, you know, I could preach this next week, but I'm kind of I'm going to go ahead and steal my thunder a little bit. But he says, "For there is one God and one mediator to between God and men, the man Christ Jesus." So, right there again, just great verses that are showing us, you know, the that there are there are uh, three persons in the Godhead. That God the Father and God the Son are two different people, because you have uh, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now, now, no one's going to get up, you know, unless they're Jehovah Witnesses or something and say, Jesus Christ isn't God, unless you're a Mormon. Any Baptist is going to say, yeah, Jesus Christ is God. Well, not he's God, but he's also the mediator between God and men. So how is that possible? Because God, our Savior, is God, our Father, and he is a different person within the Godhead. So <clears throat> it's just kind of some interesting, uh, you know, terminology it uses there, referring to God the Father as God, our Savior. Which really, again, shouldn't shock us because of the fact that it was for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. 
you know, Jesus, yes, came and did all the work and he died for our sins and he is our Savior. But just as much as he is our Savior, God the Father is our Savior because he is the one who sent his Son into the world to die for us. He is the one that willingly gave him up and sacrificed him for us. Go ahead and turn over to Titus chapter 1, verse 1. This is something that comes up over and over again in scriptures, this, this use of this phrase, God our Savior. <clears throat> you say, well, how, how is it that God the Father can be God our Savior? Well, I'll remind us, you're going to Titus 1, where it says in Acts 2, it says, This Jesus hath God raised up, where, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being uh, by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. So it was the Father that raised up Jesus. I mean, that's how he saves us. We're justified through his resurrection. We're justified through his death, burial, and re uh, resurrection. So again, it was God that raised him up, God the Father. So you can see how God the Father is God our Savior, even, even every bit as much as Jesus is. If you're there in Titus chapter 1, look at verse 1. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in uh, due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, mine own son of the faith, common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and, uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. So there again, you're, you're seeing God the Father being referred to as the Savior. He says, God our Savior. A little bit later here, God the Father. And at the end, he's saying, and Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Is it possible for God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ to both be our Savior? Yes, it is. Because they both played a very, uh, they both played a part in our salvation. And this is because God is three persons and one God. You know, and we understand that from 1 John 5, 7. Nothing can be clear. For there are, there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three, are again, are, are one. Now, just being one, does that make them all the same thing? I mean, would you say that about verse 8? That because there, that, that there, uh, there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood? Well, they, but the Bible says that they agree in one. That's how they're one, in that they agree. They all have the same uh, they all have the same uh, uh, point. They all believe the same thing. They are all in agreement one with another. The Spirit, the water, and the blood all testify to the same thing, just like God, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost all testify to the same thing. They all have the same mind. So we could see how uh, God is three persons in one God. You know, we could even talk about the fact that the Holy Spirit raised up Jesus. You know, you could say that He played a part in our salvation because of the fact that it says that He was raised up by the Spirit. <clears throat> and, and, you know, we won't go into all that tonight. We've got a, a few more verses to get into and a lot, a lot more that I'd like to talk about. But I thought that was interesting just starting right out of the gate, how you can get just some deep doctrine right out of a greeting written by Paul. Just even something as simple as a greeting, him greeting Timothy, just starting out an epistle. He's only a verse or two in. And already you're just seeing all this doctrine coming out of this book, this great, powerful doctrine that, again, we need to be reminded of. So we're there in verse 3, 1 Timothy chapter 1. It says in verse 3, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith so do. So we see here that when, when Paul uh, gave Timothy a charge, and part of that charge that he gave him was that they would teach no other doctrine. That was what he was to go to command and teach. When he was left there in Ephesus, and Paul left him and said, look, in the same way I left you in Ephesus, I want you to do the same thing as you did then. I want you to charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So again, this kind of goes back to uh, you know, biblical authority, that there are certain doctrines that are final and that they, we don't waver from, and that there's things that should not be teached, or excuse me, should not be taught. He says, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. He said, teach no other doctrine. So we should only teach those things that we can prove from Scripture. You know, we shouldn't be teaching strange things. We shouldn't be teaching fables, right? What would be fables? Fables will just be things that, you know, don't have any basis in Scripture. You know, they're just some old wives' tale that's been handed down or it's just you know some some false gospel. It's just some uh, you know extra biblical writing that people are going to get up and try to teach as doctrine. 
And he's saying, don't even give heed to it. You know, let alone teach it. Don't give heed to these things. And endless genealogies. You know, be, and, and, and ge genealogies, they're endless. It just keeps going on and on and on and on. And people get our, uh, so caught up you know, in their heritage, and they think that their pedigree is what matters. And he says, all these, why is it that they're not to do that? Why are we to uh, not teach another, any other doctrine than we have been taught? Or, or, or why are we to not teach any other doctrine that we can't uh, teach from this book, from the Word of God? Why is it that we're not to give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith? So do. It's because they minister questions. And, you know, that's something that people get caught up in a lot. It's just they want to start talking about things and debating things and discussing things. And all it does is minister questions. Just questions upon questions. What well, did you consider this? And what about that? What did you ever think about this? And guys will just sit around and they'll just sit around and they, they feel like they're having this real spiritual question, uh, uh, conversation. But all they're doing is just ministering questions. They're just, and no one's being edified. You know, there's so many things that are so clear, so many things that are so uh, emphasized in the Scripture. We ought to emphasize the thing God, God emphasizes in the Bible. Those are the things that we should be teaching one another. Those are the things that we should be discussing. Let's talk again about the Trinity. You know, we know about the Trinity. Let's talk again about salvation being by faith through grace. Let's talk about eternal security. Let's talk about any number of things from Scripture that we know are to be true. Rather than to sit around and just kind of talk about things that do nothing other than just minister more questions. Just for the sake of sounding spiritual, but not actually being spiritual. Because that which is spiritual is that which is going to edify you. You know, if, if you're actually the conversation, or the preaching, or the teaching, is, is, is you're going to walk away and say, wow, I feel like a better Christian for having heard that. I, or having that discussion, or talking about that topic. It's something that actually, uh, you know, uh, pertains to my life. It's actually something I could put into practice. And, and live a better Christian life for it. <clears throat> you know, so we should avoid teaching those things and we should avoid preaching those things. But you know what we should also avoid is listening to these type of things. You should avoid listening to fables and endless genealogies or anything that just ministers questions. And that's a strong warning today and that's something we really ought to think about because of the fact you can get on YouTube and you can listen to a lot of things that are just going to minister questions. You know, is the earth flat? Is there a dome over the earth? You know, is it a hollow earth? You know, have you heard of that one? Is it a concave earth? Uh, you know, there's these things, just questions that are coming up. Questions, questions, you know. You know, is Bigfoot real? You know, and there's just, you know, all these th different things. But, I mean, it's out there. And people spend their time just chasing after these things. And they're things that don't edify. You know, I don't, even if you got down to the, let's say you solved the Bigfoot theory. Like, you just confirmed it, beyond a shadow of a doubt. He's not real, Right? Amen. He's not real. And uh, <laughs> those photos were fake, people. But even if you got to the bottom of that, well, I mean, was that really going to help your Christian life? No. You know, that you figured out that Loch Ness just didn't exist or did exist? Like, that's, these things are just questions. They're just, just nonsense. And we shouldn't waste our time listening to this kind of stuff. Now, I mean, some, from time to time, this stuff's kind of fun to go and say, what are these, you know, what are these wackos into and, and, and listening? And you hear these type of things. But we shouldn't just spend hours just listening to the stuff and taking it in and then going and talking to other people about it. Hey, did you hear about, you know, the reptilians that the, <laughs> right? Some of you have heard about this. You know, like, did you hear about the, how the moon is actually a star base for the reptilians? And that every politician and every movie, st folks, I've got, we've got stuff in the mail at, at Faithful Word where people are sending full-size laminated sheets with just a collage of pictures <laughs> with people with, every one of them's got reptilian eyes. And it's like, have you ever heard of Photoshop? You know, have you ever, I mean, you ever, and they're all like grainy images. No one ever gets that crystal, you know, we're living in the age of just high def, you know, 4K. Every, every one of these pictures always is just a little fuzzy, you know, you just, <laughs> just fuzzy enough, you can't quite make it out. You know, is it a goose or is it Loch Ness? We don't know, <laughs> you know, so. But these are the type of things that, are, that, that people just spend their time on. Right. And all it does is just minister questions, you know, and it just questions upon questions, and they just ask more and more, and nobody walks away edified. And, and, and Paul here is warning Timothy to, to, to not do that, to command that there are certain things we ought to teach, there's certain things that we ought to dwell on, there's certain things that we ought to uh, uh, spend our time discussing and, and studying and looking into, and then the things that are in this book that we can prove. So <coughs> he goes on here in uh, 
I'll just move along in verse 5 where he says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. So <clears throat> that's a really uh, you know, great verse there. He says, again, let me just read it. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure... Now, what's he talking about the end of the commandment? He's talking about the end of the law. Like Jesus said, you know, the, the law and the prophets uh, hang on these two commandments. You know, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and love thy neighbor on the, uh, as thyself. Uh, you know, upon, upon all the, these two, all the other commandments hang, right? That's the point of the commandments. You know, if we want to just boil down what it is we ought to do with our lives to please God and to keep his commandments, it's to love the Lord our God with all our heart and to love our neighbors as ourselves. You know, because if you, you know, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Right. So if we love our neighbor, we're, we're, we're naturally going to keep the, the law. You know, we're not going to do those things uh, to our neighbor that would cause us to break the law. I mean, go read the Ten Commandments sometime. Right. A lot of them had to do the things that you would be offending your brother. You'd be offending your uh, neighbor. You know, you'd be stealing, you'd be coveting, you'd be doing these uh, wicked things. But if you're going to love your neighbor, you're not going to do those things to him. And he's saying that's the end of the commandment is charity, which is just another word for love. So he's saying the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. You know, it's talking about your motives. Why is it uh, that, you, that you have this charity? You know, out of a pure heart and of a good conscience. You know, that, that, that's a good thing to have right there, a good conscience. You know, it's really nice to live your life without having to look over your shoulder and wonder about the things that you've been up to catching up to you. Or when you've been doing somebody wrong, you know, you've been cheating somebody, you've been stealing somebody and wondering, like, did they find out? Do they know? Are they going to catch up on me? And like, is, you know, you're waiting for the IRS man to just come knocking one day and say, hey, you know, not that paying your taxes is necessarily, you know, pay your taxes, okay? But uh, you see what I'm saying here, that, you know, we want to have a good conscience. We don't want to have to sit here and worry about, uh, you know, our bad deeds catching up to us. We want to be able to lay our heads down our pillows at night and just be able to go to sleep. Because, and if we, if, we have, if we keep the commandments and we have charity of a pure heart, that's what we're going to have. We're going to have a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. <clears throat> you know, true faith is, uh, produces sincere motives, right? If you have an unfeigned faith, you're going to have a pure heart. You're going to do, be doing things for the right reasons. And it's going to be something that profits others. So, uh, 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 you know, when you, have, when you have an unfeigned faith, that's something that other people are going to be able to, to glean from. And uh, <coughs> if you would, turn over to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. In 2 Peter chapter 1, I'll begin reading in verse 5 where it says, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to your vir virtue knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly and to kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and bound, they make you that you shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's, Peter here is showing us that you know we develop our faith, our faith unfeigned, that real, true, sincere faith that is out of a pure heart. That's something that we develop. And how do we develop that? We add it. We develop our unfeigned faith by adding spiritual character to it. I mean, if you read these these virtues that are given here, he's talking about add your faith, virtue, knowledge. These are all things that are for you. You know, I don't go to somebody else and give them virtue. I don't go to somebody else and give them knowledge. You know, I can't add these things to you, and 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 you know, I can't add pen, uh, temperance and patience and brotherly kindness. I can't make those things. Uh, 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 manifest them in your lives. But if these things be in you, the bound, they shall make you that you should be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We develop these things, our unfeigned faith, so that we can benefit others. See, we have to have these spiritual characters, this unfeigned faith that we build upon so that we can benefit other people. And that's the purpose of it, is for the profiting of other people. <clears throat> and that's why it's all done out of charity. You know, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. Why is it that we should have unfaded faith? Why is it that we should develop these spiritual characters? So that we can have uh, uh, charity towards our neighbor, that we can work uh, love towards our, our neighbor. And we should do all of that out of right motives. You know, a lot of people, they, they sound like they're real spiritual. They sound like they're really, they're, they're really in it for the right reasons. But when you start to really look at what, why they do things, you find out they're not doing it out of a fa unfeigned faith. It's a feigned faith. They're doing it for carnal reasons. They're doing it for unspiritual reasons. 
In 1 Corinthians 13, if you memorize it, you would know verse 1 where it says, Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not charity, I become as sounding brass or as a tinkling, <coughs> tinkling cymbal. So you would say, well, this guy is a great orator. You know, he can, he can speak very well. He's, he's very moving. Everything sounds so good. But if he doesn't have charity, what does it profit anybody? You know, what does it do? And it doesn't do anybody any good. If I just, you know, if, if, if the whole point of, of the ministry is just to come here and to listen to somebody, and it's certainly not this guy, we get up and just, you know, tickle your eardrums a couple times a week. But we never had charity in your heart. We never went out and actually tried to profit somebody through preaching the gospel. So there's a, there's a pitfall for those who have a wrong motive, right? We see there in verse 5, again in 1 Timothy, where he says the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. He's saying these are the things that you want. This is what you should have. These are the things that you need to endeavor to have in your life. And there's a pitfall for those who have these wrong motives, who do not do it out of an unfeigned faith. Look at verse 6. From which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. You know, these are people, that they, what have they swerved from? What is it they have turned aside from? They've turned aside from charity. They've turned aside out of a good conscience and a faith and fame. They've left that behind. They said, no, thank you. They've gone the other way. They've swerved. And where do they end up in? They end up in vain jangling. You know, tinkling cymbal. You know, just say a lot of noise, but it's not profiting anybody because it's not being done out of a pure heart. And it says in verse 7, they desire, desiring to be teachers of law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they be affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Now, I, I want to kind of focus in here in verse 8 <coughs> where it says, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. So there is a lawful way to use the law and then there's an unlawful way to use law. And it's good when we use it the right way, when we actually apply the law. Meaning this, that you have to actually acknowledge that the law is there and that it still applies. And there's a lot of churches today, they want to just say, oh, that's Old Testament. We don't pay any attention to that. Now, certainly there are certain, uh, there are things in the Old Testament that have been done away in Christ. Talking about the meats, the drinks, the diverse offerings, the, moon, the new moons, the holy days. The th you know, th there being a change in the priesthood, there's made also of necessity a change in the law also. So, of course, we know because there's certain changes in, in the priesthood, those sacraments, those type of things, the rituals have changed. Those have been done away in Christ. But that doesn't mean we just throw out the rest of the law. We don't throw out the commandments of God. You know, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Now it's okay for us to go marry our aunt or something. I mean, the, the law forbids that. That's in the Old Testament. You know, there's, there's certain things you shouldn't do. All of a sudden, incest is okay because Jesus, I mean, this is the ridiculousness that's out there, though. Yeah. When you want to boil it down, you say, I can't even bring that up. Well, this is the way people think. Yeah. They just think, oh, well, there's no law anymore. Everything's done away in Christ. We don't, we don't apply the law anymore. That's, that's not true. And it, the law is good, the Bible says, if we use it lawfully, meaning we actually use it, we exercise it. <coughs> and, you know, a lot of churches today, they just only want to, they want to preach the grace of God and they want to leave off the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith. And, you know, mercy and faith, yes, we love that part. There's the first part, Judgment. You know, you can't have mercy on somebody if there's no judgment, right? And these are the weightier matters of the law. These are the things that we have to uh, put into practice. And, these, and the Bible says here that these things are good, that it is good. The law is good if a man uses it lawfully. <coughs> so turn over, you would, to Romans chapter 7. And the Bible says a lot about the law in the New Testament, right? You're going to Romans 7, look at verse 7. What shall we say then? Verse 7. Is the law sin? God forbid. And I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, uh, wrought, in manner, uh, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. And when that which is good is, is that which uh, was then that which is, made, uh, is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might be a pure sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. It's a lot. He's saying a lot there. But you know what it boils down to? The law is good. You know why the law is good? Because it condemns you. You know why the law is good? You know why it's go out to go, uh, good when you go out door knocking and tell somebody, hey, you're a sinner? It's good to condemn them because they are condemned. You're bringing them to a place where they understand 
They're lost. They have the need of a Savior. That's what's great about the law, is it brings us to Christ. <coughs> I'll read to you from Galatians chapter 3, where it says, Wherefore then serveth the law. It was added because of transgressions, till the seed shall come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under, so under sin that the promise uh, by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. So we can see how the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. It's good to go out and say, you know, uh, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't lie, you shouldn't cheat, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't do all these other sins. And people say, well, I've done that. And you say, well, that's good you know, that, that you acknowledge that because now you have a schoolmaster that's bringing you unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So he's saying there, look, the law is good if you use it lawfully. It's good to go out and, and take the law and show people their sins so that they might realize their need for a Savior. <clears throat> Verse 9 of 1 Timothy says, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane. So he starts out just kind of generalized. I mean, you could just say these things are kind of just general, uh, a, a general uh, description of people, right? The lawless and disobedient. It's not getting real specific about specific, you know, laws that are being broken. For the ungodly and for sinners. For unholy and profane. I mean, this could be anybody, right? And then he starts to kind of narrow it down. And he says, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers. For manslayers. So now he's starting to bring it home a little bit. You know, the law is good there in the, because of the fact that it's made for people that need to be executed. To show people that... Look, th these are wicked people that need to be. The Bible says these people should be put to death. That if any, you know, whosoever sheddeth a man's blood by a man shall his blood be shed. You know, and that uh, these are things that, that we learn from the law. <coughs> for murders of fathers, for murders of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So he starts out, he kind of just applies it generally, you know, and then he starts to get more specific. And every one of those specific things has a God-ordained punishment. You know, we won't take the time to go through all of it, but in many cases, it's death. You know, and, 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 and one of them that I want to focus in on tonight, and this is just something I kind of want to get off my chest because it's something I had to deal with recently, not directly, but praise God. But he focuses in, our, in there, he says, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers. So what are men-stealers? Basically, a, men, a man-stealer is a kidnapper. You know, we, we think, of, we use the word man sometimes to describe humanity, right? Mankind. So it's not just a guy who only steals men. You know, that's not what, that's not what it means. It means he's stealing any manner of person. You know, whether man, woman, boy, girl. It's a man-stealer. That is a kidnapper, right? And... <coughs> Kidnappers, you know, they come in a lot of different forms, right? You, we could talk about how they used to, they used to go to Africa and, and kidnap uh, the natives over there and bring them over and sell them into the slave trade, right? And uh, even, even I've been reading a book on uh, Native American history where they, you know, uh, uh, um, the, the Mexicans were coming up and stealing Navajo children for, that's been going on for centuries, and selling them into slavery. And you know what? Nothing's changed. Uh, you know, I was up on the Navajo, and we were having a real hard time in this neighborhood, and I couldn't figure out why. And then about, I'm, I'm driving around trying to pick up my last team before we move to another spot, and one of the locals comes out and flags me down. And he says, hey, I just want to let you know that just last week someone came through here in a van and grabbed some of our kids. And he says, everybody in the neighborhood is, knows everyone in here, and they're all calling and wondering why you're driving around in this van. And he kind of started to grill me a little bit. I said, man, I'm sorry to hear that. That's not what we're doing. I got a van load of people. You know, but this still t goes on today. And this is, this is and, you know, it kind of made sense to me then why people, every, when I was going to the door, people were just cracking the door. And not, I mean, not even wanting to take the DVDs. Just wanted me to go away. You know, and if we were in a marked van. You know, praise God, he kind of looked at it and he was like, well, you guys are legit. And I kind of explained what we were doing. And I tried to give him the gospel. He, he, he didn't want to hear it. 
But, you know, poor brother Ball, we rented him a van. He was in a white van. <laughs> so <laughs> he's driving around the res in a white van. He gets stopped by the, he got stopped by the, uh, the, sa the, the, basically the res police, whatever you want to call them up there. And they're like, and, and he got grilled. He got the third degree. Like, what are you doing? Because a lot of times what they'll do, they're telling me is that they'll send out scouts. People will just go around and look, right? And where do they target? They're targeting a poor community, people who can't do anything about it. They don't have the manpower to police that, to stop that. So, you know, that's something that's been on my heart. When I, you know, I wanted to preach about this last Sunday, and I said, well, wait a minute, First Timothy deals with this. It talks about men stealers. So I was just kind of saving it up for tonight, but, you know, and the Bible has, just like the rest of these people, it has a punishment for men stealers. It tells us what is to be done here. And, you know, this is something that takes place today. This is something that could, you know, the law is still good today. The law could still be applied to these people. And, and it ought to be. Right. And, uh, you know, they, they come in all different forms. And at the end of the day, it all comes down to slavery. You know, to some form of slavery. You know, whether it's something lewd and, and graphic and, and, and perverse, or whether it's even just being sold into some kind of uh, you know, work to actually get you know, monetary gain out of it. It all comes down to money at the end of the day. Somebody's making money off of this. Some kind of uh, you know, s abduct people and sell them for profit. That's basically what a man stealer is. And it takes place today in the, in the form of you know, human trafficking is what we're calling it today. You know, and, and really it's something that we've got to think about, especially where we live. You know, in Tucson, in Phoenix, in the Southwest. We're very close to Mexico. Uh, this kind of thing takes place. You know, people are trying to come up here and make a better life for themselves. You've got to, you know, and, and, and our government certainly isn't making it any easier for them. Right. You know, they're, they're, they're putting up fences and, and saying, you know, you can't come in and, and making it very difficult to get in here. But they're desperate to get over here, you know, because their country has been, you know, run over by the, the, the drug lords, you know, because everyone over here wants drugs. So it's kind of this weird thing, you know, and... Everyone's trying to get out of there. They want to get escape the violence. They want the better life. Who can blame them? But there's a wicked element there that takes advantage of these people. And you get into human trafficking. So that's something that happens here. You know, and this is something that uh, came close to my life. I remember when I was about eight or nine years old, living in Rapid City, South Dakota. With, and and we, my parents took me and my younger sister to the, to the, uh, to the mall. And they were going to do their Christmas shopping at Target. So she gives me a, a, a handful of quarters and says, take your daughter, not your daughter, excuse me, take your sister down to the arcade. So that's over in the food court. And so we're going to the arcade. I've been there a hundred times. I'm walking down there and, and, and my sister's on this side. And I don't know, I, I, I think it was God. I look back now, I think it was just God sparing me. But I remember looking over at in the food court and there's these two guys sitting and they're eating and they're on these dirty overalls. Like the f not, not like the, the bib overalls, but like the full covered up uh, overalls. I could still see them. And they got the wool knit hats, just big beards. Just, and then one of them, just the, some about the way he looked at me and just wouldn't stop looking at me. And, I, and I'm, now I'm an eight-year-old with a pocket full of quarters, okay? Ready? I'm, I'm, I can see the arcade. So for me to have done, done what I did next, obviously there was something going on here. I grabbed my sister without even thinking. I just said, we're out of here. And there was just something about the guy, way that guy looked at me. And, you know, we got all the way back to Target. And, I, I mean, and we're looking behind us. They had gotten up and started following us. And they're following us. And we walked faster. They walked faster. And we got all the way to Target. And this is how frightened I was. My, I caught my parents just as they were getting the checkout line. Checkout line. They had all of our Christmas presents. I didn't even look. I didn't even <laughs> think to look at my Christmas presents. That's how freaked out I was. My mom's like, oh, what are you doing? And I'm just like, there's these two guys. And she's just kind of like, eh, you know. Just go sit over there in the Target food court, you know? Because you know how Target has its own food court, you know, with all the, the chili cheese dogs and everything. I hear they're good. But uh, <laughs> so I start going back. I'm like, all right, cool. So I'm walking back, and I'm starting to calm down. I look down the aisle, and, the, you know, the other guy, he's walking. One of the guys that was following us is walking. And you know how the, you walk through the aisles? Well, I look down at him, and he's looking the other way down the aisle like this, looking for us. They're walking up and down the aisles. So you say, well, it's just your imagination. You're just a kid. And look, that made an impression on me, and I realized that, that day. Now, granted, I grew up in the time of that show, Unsolved Mysteries, <laughs> where every other episode was the white panel van, like grabbing kids and stuff like that. But that was legit. That, that was real. You know? and, and, and it's, is it really that far-fetched to think that that type of thing goes on? Not at all. It happened you know, 
It happens every day. The Bible, I, actually, I read an article where it says in every 40 seconds in the United States, a child becomes missing or is abducted. Every 40 seconds, you know, less than a minute. Now, how many have gone missing? I mean, I know it's just a, they average that out, but think about that. By the time this sermon's done tonight, how many kids? 60? Gone missing. In, in the United States. <laughs> At the end of 2017, the Bureau of National Crime Information Center Missing, mission, uh, missing persons file contained more than 32,000 records of children on the age of 18. Based on the identity of the perpetrator, there are three distinct types of kidnapping. Kidnapping by a relative of the victim's family kidnapping, which makes up about 49%, so it's somebody who's related to the child. You know, a lot of this is divorced parents, and one of them's taking the kids and running away. You know, that is technically kidnapping. Kidnap, you know, according to the law, I mean, I don't I want to get into all the minutiae of that, but Kidnapping by an acquaintance of the victim, you know, somebody who maybe was working there, knew the family, what have you. And kidnapping by a stranger to the victim, uh, stranger to the victim or a stranger uh, kidnapping, which is about 25% of these kidnappings is done by a stranger. I remember even younger, being like five, six years old in, and playing in, the, in Rapid City, South Dakota. I don't know what it was about that town. But I remember a guy pulling up in his car and saying, hey, I lost my puppy dog. Can you help me come find him? And, there, and that same, around that same time, everyone was freaking out in our school because some guy pulled up in a van and just grabbed one of the kids out in front of our school and took off. I mean, and where were we? Rural community, poor community, real easy to get away, real easy to not be found, just get out in the woods and disappear. So, you know, it's, it's, it's terrible. You know, they try to lure them into vehicles. They have all these, you know, things uh, that they say to try to get kids to come with them. You know, and I wish some of the younger children were here tonight so we could kind of warn them, you know, about that because it's a real danger. You know, and kids, they're, for lack of a better word, they're kind of dumb. <laughs> they're innocent. They're naive. They just kind of think everybody's okay, that they're, these type of people don't exist. But they do exist, and they're dangerous. And we got to look out for them, you know, and we got to warn our kids about these people. You know, and don't think that you're ever being, you know, you're going to, you know, a lot of people say, well, you don't want to freak the kids out. Well, you know, it's going to be a lot scarier if they, uh, uh, you know, they are not warned and something like this happens. You know, I thought about that guy all, all that weekend that came out and talked to me the, up there on the res about that kidnapping. And, I, and the whole time I was out there, I was thinking about it after that. And I just thought, man, I don't know what I, if, what I would, if I was given the option of having one of my children abducted or being shot in the head. Like, I don't know. That's, I, I think I would rather die than see one of my children taking it and, and have who knows what done to them. Right. You know, so, I mean, it's, it's a terrible thing, but it happens all the time. That's why it's important that we bring this up. I mean, the Bible addresses, you know, talks about men stealers. And, uh, you know, I don't want to get into all the more gruesome details about this, this article, but, you know, it, the sad thing is, one of the, th the facts that it gives is that usually if a child is abducted, they're dead within three hours. I mean, it's, it's, it's a gruesome business. It's just terrible what happens to these kids. And it happens all the time. And I really, I really wish we, we could warn, you know, we should be warning our children, especially our younger children, don't go with strangers. Don't, don't go near, you know, they, I remember seeing a, some kind of undercover video dateline thing or whatever where they, some guy pulled up into a cul-de-sac in, in suburban America somewhere and they had all the, the kids playing out there and they, they told the parents they were going to do it. They got them all in the back, in one of the backyards and let them watch the video. And the guy just pulls up with a car and says, hey, I got these, these puppies in my trunk. Want to come see them? And he opens up the trunk, and he's just got this kid standing there. I mean, how easy would it be just, boom, bam, and you're gone. So, you know, again, the kids need to be warned about this stuff, that this type of thing happens. And, if, you know, if you ever have uh, any doubt about somebody, you know, trying, to, if you think that they're up to something, just get away from them. You yell, kicking, and screaming. I told my kids, if they, anyone ever picks you up, that you, you know you don't know or makes you f afraid to just scream your head off and, you know and that's one of the best things uh, that you can do but you know we talk about the kids this happens to adults this kind of stuff happens all the time and you know what the law is good amen because the law has a, a, a way of dealing with these people right. these people that do these horrible wicked terrible things to children even and the law has a punishment for those that would be considered men stealers and I won't read to you, but it says, uh, it says, He that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely serve 10 to 20. No, that's not what it says. 
He doesn't say that he's going to go to a federal prison and get on parole in a few decades and they're going to let him back out and reform him. And he's just going to go around and tell his neighbors what he did t 10, 20 years ago. And he's always going to be on a list and he's going to have background checks and he's never going to get a job here or there. No, it says, he that he shall surely be put to death. Amen. And to me, I read that and I say, the law is good yeah, if a man use it lawfully. And we should be putting these type of people to death. Right. You know, because, uh, because I can't, it's coming, I'm trying to bring it back to mind, but the proverb, uh, uh, because, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but because justice is not swiftly executed, uh, uh, men's hearts are fully set to do evil. You know, basically saying that because justice, because things that people are not being swiftly executed according to the law, men, are, their hearts are fully set to do evil. I mean, if you're one of these filthy, wicked pedophiles and you have it in your heart, you have this burning lust to, 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 that you want to fulfill, and you know that the punishment is potentially being put away in jail or, or federal prison for, for... I mean, some of them are getting slaps on the hands, people. Right. Some of them are <laughs> doing... They're doing less years than people who get pulled over for smoking a joint or something. Yeah. I'm, and, and I'm not condoning smoking pot, but I'm just saying, like, it's a far cry from being a, 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 you know, someone destroying some child's life. But if you're one of these guys and you're, you're into that, that's your thing, and you're going to sit there and weigh out the consequences. And some of these guys, they weigh it out and they say, it's worth it. Me going to a federal prison for 10 years, nah, that's fine. It's worth it. As long as I get to fulfill this sick lust that I have, and maybe I won't get caught. But I tell you what, if they started seeing them swinging from a rope, right. if they saw them, you know, with the, with the, the you know, the, the city gathered, you know, the, you know, the men of the, of the town gathered around. If, oh, you know, we caught, they caught that guy up in the Navajo right. and they took him down to the rock quarry and yep. stoned him. And the other perverts saw that happen. They might think twice about what they were going to do. Right. Maybe they'll think, well, it's not worth it. But they carried out. Why is it every 40 seconds? Because, you know, justice is not being executed in the land. That's why we have these terrible statistics. <coughs> because men's hearts are fully set <coughs> to do evil. And he says there, that's the punishment. If you steal a man, or you sell a man, or if you be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. Now, what I'm about to say next, you know, might be a little controversial. You might not agree with me, with me about it. But this is how I feel about it. I would put CPS workers in that, in that same category. Amen. Anybody that would come to someone's door and say, you're not raising your kids right, and we're going to take them from you. Amen. How is that not a man stealer? Right. How is that not somebody coming and stealing a man? And saying, oh, you smoke pot. You don't have, I, people get wrote, wrote up for, ha they, they say, we're going to inspect your home. Oh, you've got dirty dishes in the sink. This is an unsafe environment. Give us your kids. Right. You don't think that happens? Right. I'm not saying there aren't terrible situations that it's unfortunate for kids to be living in. And, and you know, but that's a whole other ball of wax. But we can't just have this system that just allows people to just walk in right. and just say, well, th this doesn't meet our standards. We're taking your kids. Yeah. And you know what a lot of times they do? They end up selling them into the foster care agencies. They right. started selling them to the adoption programs. And that's why I, you know, personally, you do what you want. I don't participate in it. Right. I'm not going to get into foster care. I'm not going to adopt. Right. You know, I, I, people get into it with full good intentions. I've known great people, great men and women of God who've raised great godly kids in the foster care system. I'm not against them. I personally will not participate in it because I feel that it is supporting a wicked system. Amen. So that's just how I feel about it. And, and you know, <laughs> there would be a lot of people that would do well to, heed, to take heed to that verse. You know, that, that they shouldn't just be waltzing in other people's homes and snatching their kids. Right. You know, for spanking them. Yep. You know, that's, that's coming down the pike. Yeah. You know, I, I've known people who've had people knock on their door at 11 p.m., and then they say, well, we suspect you of, of child abuse. Yep. And we want to look at your kids. Yep. We want to take them aside privately and examine them physically and ask them questions and frighten them and see if we can't get them to say something about you that will justify us taking them. And that, my friend, I, whether you like it or not, my belief is, is that is stealing a man. Right. <clears throat> that is a man stealer. And the law, or the, the law is clear what, what we should be doing with those types of people. So, moving on from that rather unpleasant topic, here we're going to go into verse 11 where it says, According to the glorious gospel of our, uh, of our blessed God, of the blessed God which was committed to my trust, 
And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. So, you know, it's interesting there that Paul says he was put into the ministry. And now that's something a lot of guys today should probably take heed to. A lot of these guys that just want to self-ordain, <coughs> uh, you know, these guys that just want to go out and just or say, call themselves a pastor, <coughs> you know, these guys really should take heed to this, that, they, that Paul was put into the ministry. And they'll say, oh, oh, we were put in the ministry just the same way Paul was, by God, right? But here's the thing about Paul. Paul, Paul was uh, he counted faithful. You know, he was found faithful. You know, and, and he was already serving. You know, he was, a lot of these guys that just go off on the rails, they just lose cannons, they're going to be their own pastors and start their own churches just out of uh, thin air. They're not ordained by anybody. You know, they haven't even been in a church. They're not even faithful to a local church for any length of time. And then, but now they're going to run one. You know, we haven't been serving in a local church. You know, we don't, we don't know the ins and outs of the ministry, but we're going to start one. And we're going to expect everybody else to come and, and, and be faithful to our church and sit under my preaching and be faithful to our services, even though I've never done that. You know, <coughs> so we could see, yeah, Paul was called by God, but he was counted faithful, first of all. <coughs> so he goes on here and he says uh, that unqualified, uh, he's saying that he was faithful, he was put in the ministry. And unqual uh, unqualified individuals uh, they run stating they were ordained of God. And, you know, there's a lot of caveats here. They want to use Paul as the example. Say, well, Paul did it. You know, this, this is the example of Paul. I'm just doing what Paul did. You know, Paul wasn't, uh, you know, he, he was, you know, he wasn't, uh, well, but here's the thing about Paul. He wasn't a pastor, first of all. Right. You know, he was an evangelist. He was an apostle. And Paul really fulfilled a very special place in history. I mean, if you're going to say, well, I'm following Paul's examples, and we're like, well, let's see you do what Paul did then. First of all, you know, I mean, like, you, you, you've kind of set the bar pretty high with Paul, using him as your example. I mean, he's somebody that was really unique individual, uh, was somebody who was used in a very special way. And, but bottom line is, Paul was counted faithful before he was put in the ministry. He didn't just put himself in the ministry. You know, a lot of these, I've heard these guys say, well, the Holy Spirit told me that I'm supposed to do this, that I'm supposed to go start this church and be a pastor. It's like, he didn't tell you that. Right. That's the imagination of your own heart. Right. You know, and it's like, oh, he told you that? Well, let's all write that in our Bibles. Yeah, exactly. Right? That's, a lot, that's my, my favorite comeback that I've ever heard. Oh, really? So which gospel should we put that in? Yep. Because it sounds like you've got new revelation from God, and I want to have every word of God. So if God's talking to you, you know, I've got some blank pages back here. <laughs> And says, and, and then Paul said to so and so, or uh, the Holy Spirit said, you know, let's get that, let's get that in there. But that's not what's taking place at all. And these people are just making things up. <clears throat> and then he says in verse thirteen, he describes the type of person that he was, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorant and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first uh, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So Paul, I love these verses. This is something I've thought about from time to time and preached other sermons about this is that Paul, God used Paul and chose Paul for this cause. He, he says, I obtain mercy. For the mercy, to, to serve as an example, basically, that Paul serves as an example of God's mercy, of God's long-suffering, and of God's exceeding abundant faith and love of Christ. That's what, he's, that's what Paul is. Because remember, he was, an injur he was an injurious, he was a persecutor, he was a blasphemer. He was a wicked man. You know, he, he, he destroyed the church, admittedly, said that. He would, he would come and hail them, and he would... Uh, the, the members of the church and he would take them to prison often probably to be executed or whipped or whatever it is he was a, he was a persecutor of the church and but because in God was long suffering and God allowed him to he didn't harden his heart God allowed him to be to, to, to know and understand the truth and as a result you know he serves as a great example of God's long suffering that's what he says right there I mean that's plain as day in verse 16 Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ won't show forth all long suffering. And why is it then he set that example? 
for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him. He's a pattern. He's an example to me and you. Because here's the thing. People, they get saved and they, they know they're saved. They're saved. There's no doubt about it. But a lot of times they'll just start to beat themselves up about their, their past. They'll say, oh, you know, I know I'm saved, but God will never use me because X, Y, and Z, because of my past. Well, I, let's, let's compare you to Paul for a minute. Do, have you murdered uh, the church? Have you hauled away? Have you been a persecutor of the church? I mean, Paul did some pretty bad things. I mean, did you do anything anywhere near what Paul did? I mean, in some cases, people might say, yeah. But by and large, most people probably would say, no. We weren't, I wasn't that bad. You know, oh, I might have done some, pretty, some bad things. But Paul serves as an example that even in spite of our past, God can still use us mightily. That's the purpose that Paul received, the mercy that he did. For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. He's saying, look, just because you have a past doesn't mean God can't use you. Because Paul's saying, I have a past. And God is merciful and long-suffering. And he can do the same thing for any one of us. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> let's just move along here for the sake of time. Verse 17. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I mean, Paul understood the mercy and love of God and what's it lead him to? To praise. You know, instead of feeling down about yourself and beating yourself up about your past, maybe you should just be grateful that God saved you and that you could still be used of God. And it might actually lead you to a place where you utter something like verse 17, where you end up just praising God and saying, Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. We just get our minds off ourselves and start just praising God for His goodness and giving Him the glory uh, for who He is. He goes on in verse 18 and says, This charge I committed to thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. So it's interesting there, Paul likens the ministry unto a warfare. You know, and of course we know we're not, we're not fighting a physical war. You know, we struggle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers uh, of this world you know, in, in high places. So that's, the, that's the, the fight we're called to fight, is this spiritual fight against uh, you know spiritual things uh, going out and fighting for the souls of men you know not uh, trying to deliver them from some dictator or something but actually deliver them from the bonds of sin and from Satan he goes on in verse 19 and says holding faith and a good conscience which some having put away uh, concerning faith have made shipwreck of whom is <coughs> who have I delivered unto Satan and that they might learn not to blaspheme I mean, I love that he mentions these guys by name. Right. And he does, this isn't the only place he does it. Uh, you know, he does it again in uh, 2 Timothy 2. He says, Hymenaeus and Philetus. He says in 2 Timothy 4.10, Demas hath forsaken me. He talks about uh, uh, the coppersmith. Uh, I don't think I have it in here. I can't remember. Uh, Alexander the coppersmith, who did me much evil. Right? I think it's in that same, same uh, yep. yeah, verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord recorded him to his works. So Paul, you know, didn't think it was a bad thing to just call people out publicly. And, you know, it wasn't him just calling him out in a church service. It was him calling it out and having it written down in the eternal pages of God's word. Amen. I mean, how would you like to get, I mean, people get worried about getting called out for something. But, I mean, at least you weren't Hymenaeus. At least you weren't Alexander. You know, and your name's written down here. You know, I don't think any of those guys were saying I don't think. But what if they were? You know, what if one of them were? Like, Hymenaeus, where do I know that? Ah, it's not important. You know, it's a common name back then. There's a lot of them, you know. You know, you're going to meet that guy in heaven and be like, oh, oh see, so you're Hymenaeus, right? <clears throat> so, but here's the thing. Here's the point is that Paul doesn't shy away from calling people out by name right. when appropriate. You know, and that doesn't mean we just need to call out every single person for every little stupid thing. You know, he's calling out people who have made faith shipwreck, you know, and they're being turned aside into Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Uh, Alexander the coppersmith who did him much evil. You know, it wasn't just a guy who got caught up in some sin and he's got to call out Alexander the coppersmith. It was that that coppersmith, you know, he's probably making idols or of something of that nature, was opposing Paul and actually being vindictive. He was doing him much evil. So there was a point in calling him out. You know, it was appropriate. So notice the motive, though, uh, there <clears throat> in verse 20. Of whom Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. That they may learn. That's the motive there. 
And, and, and that's the purpose in executing uh, church discipline. You know, when people are called out for their sin and kicked out of the church, according to 1 Corinthians 5, for being a, you know, a covetous or a railer or a drunkard or a fornicator, you know, there's things that will get you kicked out of church and, 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 and get called out even publicly and say so-and-so is put out from the fellowship because of this sin. You know, and why is that? It's so that we can all just point and laugh, you know, and make fun of that person. And ridicule them? No, it's so that they may learn. So that they can learn that life out there in sin is not, is not worth it. And it's also to protect the church, of course. That's one of the main reasons. It's so that our kids aren't seeing people who are just living in open fornication. Right. And saying, thinking, oh, that's okay. Yeah, I know that's what the pastor preaches, but the couple over there and the couple over there and the couple over there, they're living in sin and we all know it, but he's not going to do anything about it. So, you know, obviously it's okay. Kids can grow up with that impression. And say, well, I know that's what the Bible says, but when they, what they actually see is what's going to matter. But when they see people getting put out of the fellowship, they're going to say, whoa, fornication is a wicked sin. I better watch it. Being a drunk is a wicked sin. I better not fall into that because I don't want to be put out. You know, I don't want to get called out. So, uh, but here's the thing about it. When a person, this is really what I focus in about this part, is that when a person learns that lesson, let it go. Let it go. When that person learns their lesson and they come back, and I've seen this time and time and time again. It's amazing to me. You think that person gets called out, gets their sin called out, they're put out from fellowship. You think, we'll never see them again. And sometimes down the road, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, they're back. You know what? Let that person live it down. You know, it takes a lot of humility for a person to admit they're wrong and to come back. And by the way, when they come back, they don't just show up. They usually have a conversation with, oh, I don't know, the pastor and they talk to him, and he, they work it out, and he's the one that determines whether or not they're allowed back into the church. And when the pastor allows somebody back in the church, trust your pastor that he knows whether or not they should be there. And, you know, and, I, and, it, and it just it really you know, irks me when I see somebody come back into fellowship in the church, sometimes from, from sin or blasphemy, whatever it is, but they've learned their lesson, and they're coming back into the church, and then you've got a group of people who just want, just they're not going to accept it. You know, they're just not going to let it go. And they go around, they're going to tell everybody why they don't believe it, and blah, 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 and they're going to talk a bunch of smack. That's not letting them learn, that's not letting them live it down, friend, and that's not biblical. We're going to look at it here in a minute. Go ahead and turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You need to let them live it down and let them get over it. It's hard enough to admit you're wrong and then to come back and show your face in public where everybody knows what you did because you got called out publicly. That's not easy takes a lot of humility in my opinion and uh you know people people just need to accept the, their pastors I've, I've seen people come back and i've just gone to the pastor and said hey is so and so allowed back in the church yes that's all he needs to say i don't have to say well what, well, what was the nature of their repentance you know and did they did they you know let me see if i approve of your approving of them i just trust the pastor and just say oh he must you know he knows more than i do about that situation i don't need to know all the nitty-gritty i don't need to know all the details all I need to know is the pastor's allowed them back in the church because they're truly repentant. And that's enough for me. And then at that point, it's up to us to restore such a one in the spirit of humility. The Bible says, you're in 2 Corinthians 6, it says, but in Galatians 6, the Bible says, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You know, I see people that, are, that continue to give, you know, somebody comes back in the church, and you have this little group of people that want to just continue to throw daggers and, and, and point fingers and make fun of them. Well, you know what? Those people, they better consider themselves and they better hope that they never end up doing something that gets them kicked out of the church. Because what goes around comes around. And what a man uh, reaps, that shall she, uh, that what a man sows, that shall he also reap. And it might be us one day. None of us is above uh, committing sin. One, we're all, I heard Pastor Anderson say, and this is great truth, and it's something to keep in mind. It's something I think often. You're one bad decision from ruining your life. You're one bad decision, one bad day from being that guy getting kicked out. You know, and you don't want that. So the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, it says, Sufficient unto a man uh, is the punishment which was inflicted of many. Of course, this is referring back to 1 Corinthians, where there was a man that was commonly reported that there was fornication in the church, that a man should have his father's wife. But he's referring to the fact that he was sleeping with his stepmother. Or, and, and he was kicked out of the church. He said, put, you know, deliver one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And he was put out. Now, in 2 Corinthians, we see this man was welcomed back in because he got it right 
A wicked sin like that, something as wicked as that, he got it right. And Paul is saying, sufficient to such a man is the punishment which was inflicted of many. He say, look, it's enough. He was put out. He was shamed publicly. He was called out. He was kicked out of the fellowship. It's sufficient. You don't need to continue punishing that person after they've learned their lesson and come back. So that contrary wise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him. You know, not make snide remarks. Not go to your buddies and go, I don't believe it. They're just sneaking their way back in so they can do more damage or whatever it is. Uh, and comfort him, lest perhaps one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. I mean, if you're one that's coming back, you're learning your lesson, saying, you know, you're put out and you're coming back and the, the church that you desire to be with, I mean, they're that, the whole reason you got it right is because you wanted to be back in that church and in that fellowship. And then those same people are, are not letting it go. They're still holding it over your head and saying, oh, I remember when you did this. You know, I haven't forgotten about that. That if you haven't forgotten about it, you haven't forgiven them. Because that's what forgiveness is. is to forget. And you know, considering thyself. The Bible says, with the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful. And with an upright man thou wilt show thyself upright. And with the forward thou wilt show thyself forward. You know why it's a good idea to show people mercy? is because you're probably <laughs> going to be in need of it one day too. You're going to say, God be merciful to me. He's going to look down and say, well, how merciful have you been? And he's going to consider how merciful you are to other people. And if we just go around trying to take everybody's heads off and just being a mean, vindictive person, don't be surprised when, when you find yourself in need of mercy, God's the same way towards you. And just says, you know, I show, mercif I show mercy under the merciful. <coughs> now, I'll, I'll wrap up right here. I'll just, uh, just go to Psalms 103. We'll wrap up there. <coughs> you know, people who, forget, who refuse to forget you know, and, and by the way, there's people that I know that have come back in a church that have been kicked out for sins. And, and I'm not trying to brag or anything, but I've been talking to those people and, and just totally forgot that those things even happened. And that should be normal. That should be our, our normal Christian experience. Right. That we end up just talking to somebody, you know, we start, we have fellowship with them. We totally forget. And of course, time heals all wounds and sometimes it, it takes time. But it should come to that place where we don't think about that. Like, oh yeah, I'm talking to so-and-so or I, you know, so-and-so. And every time we see or hear from that person, it's like, well, that, that's the person that did this. That's the person that you haven't forgiven them if you can't have even gotten there. Those who refuse to forgive and forget, you know what, you know about the, here's the thing about those people. They have forgotten the mercy that God extended to them. The Bible says in Psalm 103, look at verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous and, mer and, plenteous and mercy. You know, that should be our characteristics. We should try to emulate God in that way. We should be merciful and gracious and slow to anger and plenteous of mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. There's a time and place to be angry. There's a time and place to call out sin and to point it out and to kick people out. But there's also a time to then extend mercy and to be uh, gracious and slow to anger. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities, for as the, high, as, the, as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so he hath removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth uh, them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. You know, the person that we just can't forgive, we just can't let it go, we're gonna, can, always going to hang over the head, that person, their frame is dust. They're weak. They're flesh. And you know what? They're just like you. And, and we could end up in that same boat. And we should desire that God has mercy on us. You know, and, and so, that it, it, so in the, if we want that, then we have to show mercy to others. And this is just a great verse to remind us of that. That that's the nature that we should have towards others. Slow to anger. Of great compassion. Plenty of some mercy. And also, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier where he says, as far as the east is from the west, so we have to remove our transgressions from us. Get over your past. Let it go. God's forgotten about it. People keep going back to God about these old sins. And, and oh, I'm so sorry about it. He's like, what are you talking about? It's under the blood. I don't even know what you're talking about anymore. It's forgotten. It's as far as the east is from the west. So <coughs> that's, that's the admission tonight. I know we covered a, kind of a broad uh, things, but that's preaching verse by verse through, the, uh, through these books. So I hope you'll stick with me as we continue to go through 1 Timothy. Let's go ahead and pray.